and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. All right, this is a weekly show that's all about board games and the people who play them with lots of different great contributions from everybody. Now, this is going to be an unusual two weeks here together. So let's talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a bit more about what's exactly happening in uh, the, later on when I talk about Dice Tower Productions. But what we're going to be doing next week is going to the Gamma Trade Show. Now, at the Gamma Trade Show, we're going to be talking to all publishers. I have a full slate of schedules next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And we'll be, they'll be showing us games, and you'll be able to watch all of that live. So I hope that you guys can come watch that live. If you miss it live, you'll still have a chance to watch it later on. Uh, but this week, kind of as a prelude to that, we're going to be doing a lot of live events. Mostly, uh, if, you, if you missed it this past Saturday, I did a live me versus the internet in uh, Onitama. I'll be doing a lot more stuff like that throughout this week where it'll be me versus you guys. So keep an eye out for that. Just keep an eye on our schedule. We're going to have lots of little live things scheduled this week, including different live Q&As going on. So keep that in mind. And this all culminates on Saturday where we'll be doing a live gaming session with Rado. Richard uh, Ham from Rado Runs Through Games is We've brought him in to do a day of gaming. So you'll see him and Jason and Sam and Z, and we'll be doing some games there. So that's, so that's gonna bleed into the next week then with Gamma. And there'll still be some other things going on this week, but that's, it's really exciting. We have some new gear that we're testing out. So some of that is taking up our time for reviewing because we're, we're, we are have a new camera that we're learning to use and new audio equipment we're learning to use. So um, our content sometimes goes down while we're working and trying to get these things set up. but the long-term effect should hopefully be really good from all that. Well, folks, we are now in March 1 6th of 2016 is over already. Whew. Let's get to the board game news for today. Hey, in non-surprising news of the week, Fantasy Flight has announced more Star Wars Imperial Assault stuff. There's a new box, Bespin Gambit, which of course is going to be in going into Empire Strikes Back stuff, and then some corresponding packs, and of course we're going to have Lando Calrissian and Bosk. I'm actually more excited about Bosk than I am Lando. Isn't that weird? But I think Lando will be obviously the hottest selling miniature of that. And there's some other miniatures coming, and some more scenarios, and a new campaign run through, including in a box some new heroes. Looks like there's another Jedi. So if you don't like the Jedi that comes in the original uh, Imperial Assault game, there's an alternate Jedi type character. Ares Games has announced several things that they're coming out with, and notably they're going to be working with IG Games to come out with a game Behind the Throne. This is from the same people who did Mysterium. This is, from my information, a mini game. Think Love Letter, one of these micro games, so we'll see how that one comes out. But sounds interesting. The guys who designed Mysterium have done a great job. Greater Than Games announced they're bringing Exoplanets over to America, which kind of surprised me because it doesn't it's, it seems like an odd fit for their lineup. It seems like a fit more in their Dice Hate Me games lineup, but also I played Exoplanets and it's a decently good game. I was very surprised by it, but I didn't think it was fantastic. I wouldn't have gone on my way to bring it, but hey, maybe they're making some changes. Epic is the game that's doing quite well from the same company who did Star Realms, White Wizard Games, and they're gonna be having world championships now in Epic with $100,000 of prizes. Wow. That's putting your money where their mouth is in that regard. So we'll see if that has, you know, boosts that game up. Cool Mini or Not has announced an expansion for the Grizzled. The Grizzled at your orders, which includes ways for you to play solitaire or with only two players. This game that seemingly came out of nowhere last year when we saw it where everyone was like, oh, cool artwork. Then people played it and it seemed like it really got some buzz. So it'll be exciting to see an expansion for that. Stronghold has released a list of games that are coming out in 2016, 21 games. Now, a few of them are to be announced later, but and some of them we've already known about. The, of course, the Village series of games, 
uh, Bear Valley from Carl Chedek, the guy who did Glory to Rome and Innovation. Stellar Conflict, which is a game I really love. A lot of fun. The reimplementation of Lightspeed. But the one I'm, I think I'm most excited about from their list is Cities of, well, maybe Stellar Conflict, but also City of Spies, Estro 1942, which I reviewed. I was very excited about that one. If, if Stronghold hadn't reprinted it, that would have gone in the Dice Tower Essential line because that's how much I enjoyed this spy tile game. All right, Asmodee has, is bringing a couple games to America, family-style games, uh, Zany Penguins, and then Dr. Panic. Now, I had a chance to play Dr. Panic last April, and that is just an insane game where you are literally running around the table, around the room, doing different things. I'm really curious the exact audience for it. I enjoyed it, but when I was done, I was like, all right, we're done. I'll play this one next year. But hey, if you like that style, just absolute zaniness, you'll like Dr. Panic. Academy Games, Mare Nostrum's coming to market soon. That was kickstarted last year. The reprint it looks really good. I hope it's as good as it looks. And even though I mentioned Cryptozoic a couple weeks ago, there's more news from them. We already knew they were coming out with Attack on Titan game from Antoine Bowser, which I'm excited about. But there's also a deck building game, a cooperative deck building. So that's cool. And then Rick and Morty, Total Rickall. There's two games from Rick and Morty, actually, the universe, the Total Rickall. And then Mr. Mis... Mr. Misadu. Me too. Oh, I can't even remember. I even watched that episode. Anyway, Mr. Meeseeks, I forget what his name was, but I'm sure fans are annoyed at me right now for not knowing what many consider to be the best episode from that series. Uh, but anyway, there's a box and it's, it's going to make you do silly things type game. Uh, Geek Attitude. Now, this game is intriguing to me. I, I did like uh, Geek Attitudes. Uh, had an interesting last game, Taverna. This one here, Save the President, Save the World. It's about saving the president and saving the world, not because the president is a great position per se, but because there are giant monsters destroying the world. <laughs> That's just an interesting concept to me, so I look forward to seeing that. Hey, that's the news. Let's get to the Kickstarter news. Breakfast, everybody. Here's a quick look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. And just as a little reminder, make sure if something catches your eye, you check it out pretty quickly. I try to give you at least a week before the project ends when I feature it, but sometimes I cut it kind of close. House of Borgia is designed by the prolific Scott Alms and is being co-published by Talon Strike Studios and Gambling Games. This is a dice-based, hidden roll, bidding, bluffing, and deduction game, which is quite the mouthful. But basically, players are vying for influence in the hopes of becoming the next pope. Characters are assigned in secret at the beginning of the game, and then each round, players roll dice and then use those dice to bid on actions, and then use those actions to manipulate the ladder of power. But you want to be a little tricky on how you do this, because if you're too obvious with which character you're trying to influence, rumors can start, accusations can fly, and other players can rally against you. The art and components on this game look great, including a bunch of custom dice, and you can get a copy of the game for a pledge of $35 plus shipping. Widower's Wood is a game set in Privateer Press's popular Iron Kingdom setting. In this expandable cooperative game, players take on an invading evil and try to defend their lands against it. This is essentially a tactical campaign style game, but it comes loaded with Iron Kingdom's minis. And I'm not a minis person, but I gotta say, these minis look pretty incredible. Privateer Press also points out that the game can be used as a really cool RPG aid with all those minis and the tactical tiles. A pledge of $100 will get you a copy of the game and all the stretch goals. Fog of Love is a two-player game about achieving a happy ending by creating a love story together. The heart of the game is in these story cards that you'll face, and each choice that you make on those cards will determine the path of the game, including deciding whether victory is cooperative or solo. There are game mechanisms in place like simultaneous selection, hidden traits, and deduction, but this game is really all about the story that evolves and role-playing your respective characters since there are variable traits and each card has multiple scenarios. I always appreciate it when a game has an uncommon theme or setting and Fog of Love is definitely unique on that front. A copy of the game is $39 unless you live in Denmark where you can save on shipping by picking up the game at a local cafe. 
From the designer of Biblios comes the Butterfly Garden. This set collection game has players collecting butterflies to complete goal cards. The trick of the play is that players select and simultaneously play cards from their hand to their collection jar, with lower numbers being able to select new cards first, but the higher value cards having more butterflies for that set collection. There are some cards with special abilities, but overall this is a lightweight, family-friendly card game with an accessible motif. A copy of the game in the U.S. is just $15, but you can add other Dr. Finn games on as add-ons. Perplex Games is back with another round of teeny tiny games that pack a punch. Paco Games Set 2 currently includes four different games, all of them the size of an old school pack of gum, and all of them really different from each other in terms of mechanism, theme, and even art style. So is a Moncala inspired game that has players trying to collect the best bouquet through careful movement of cards from seed to flower. Jim combines drafting and action selection in this school theme game that plays up to six players. Orc is a two-player hand management game that is reminiscent of Battle Line as players compete for territories by skillfully deploying orcs to battle. And Rum is a set collection game that has a lot of interaction as players steal captain cards from each other. The designer Chris Handy has made all four base games available on Tabletopia, so if you're signed up there, you could try these games today. Like the previous packet games, additional games will be added to this set through stretch goals, and a pledge of $24 will get you a set of all base and unlock games. And finally, I wanted to highlight the ABCs of RPGs. Normally I don't cover RPG-related items, but this was too great to ignore. For a pledge of $15, you can get an RPG-themed ABC and activity book. The coloring and activities are simple and geared for children, but the ABC book, it looks wonderful with RPG-highlighted items and excellent inclusive art. I think it's something that any gamer can appreciate. There is a unique sing-along stretch goal and a couple of higher value pledge levels that include donations to literacy programs. That's all I have for you this week. Hopefully you found some of that interesting. Until next week, play all the games. Hey folks, I'm Tom Basil. Jason Levine. We, we still need more questions. So, um, we're going to answer Jeff's question. Are pinball machines board games? Yes or no? Can you consider them to be board games? Is that really the question this That's week? That's really the question. Do no. you enjoy them is the second part. Oh, wait. Let's start with the, are pinball machines board games? No, they're not board games. Well, I mean, you have a goal. It's made. How's a pinball machine different than, let's say, Crokinole? Crokinole is an actual board game. Pinball is not a board well, game. What's the difference? Okay, no. Well, because Crokinole has... Okay, I, oh, now you got me baffled because you're trying to compare pinball to crokinole and they're not the same. I mean, pinball is pinball is in the I would put it more in the video game category than board Have game. Have you heard category. of a game called Fubi? Fubi. A soccer game where you hit the little balls with the sticks and around the thing. Have, no. What about that game where you hit the balls with the hammer underneath them? Oh, um, BGG. Pirate billiards. Okay, now is it, how's that different than a pinball? I'm hitting a ball and knocking it around the board and. Because pinball. those those actually have games with lots of different ways to score. Pinball is just pin, pinball to me is a video game. It's in the video game category. You see it at video arcades. You don't you don't. I wish you saw it. Okay, at video arcades. I, I've made a new I've made a new ruling on board, <laughs> board games here. Here's the ruling: a board game must be able to be transportable and put down on a table. <laughs> That's a new rule for All a right. board Jason game. All right, Jason Levine has decreed it shall be done. Okay, I don't actually think they're board <laughs> games either. However, I will say that I think that there's a pretty big crossover between board gamers and pinball because there is some strategy um, in how you hit the thing and you're trying to get different goals and things. Yes. Um, and I love them. I know. Me too. I love pinball. I mean, we when we were in L.A., we went to we're, we went somewhere where they had all these pinball machines, which was really cool. I don't remember where it was. I think it was was on Santa Monica Pier where they had the whole room with the pinball machines. Oh, that's right. We put that one. We just kept playing and playing and playing. Yes, and pinball is cool. I someone, mean, I someone got all those quarters. <laughs> someone paid for the trip. No, I'm just saying how that. No, I'm, I'm saying that all those quarters, I, I I can't control myself around pinball. Machines. I know. Um, no, no. I mean, I used to spend lots of quarters. Some one of my friends has had a pinball machine in their house when I was younger, growing up, and we used to. And it was one of those ones where his dad rigged it so you didn't have to put the quarters in, and we used to just play it for hours on end. That's like that was so cool. Um, 
Now, the reason I'm, I am bringing this up seriously is I would like to, you guys to mention in the comments, what do you think constitutes a, constitutes a board game? Like we mentioned Crokinole, right? That's not a board game. Is Ping Pong a board game? No, Crokinole is a board game. I mean, Crokinole game. is a board game. Is la Lawn Darts a board game? Is Darts a board game? No. What do you consider to be a board game? Where is that limit? And is there a weird thing that's like halfway between? Like, you can do those little bowling games on the table. Yes. Is that a board game? Uh, well, Caveman Curling is a board game, but yet Shuffleboard is not really a board game. And but see, Shuffleboard to me really feels like a board game. It does, but it's live action board game, essentially. Or Bocce is another one where you have lawn bowling. Bocce. Yeah, that's so, true. So what do you guys think? Tell us in the comments. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Send us some real questions <laughs> at DiceTowerGmail.com. <laughs> Hey there, this is Mike with The Board Game Makeover. In today's episode, I'm taking a giant step out of the stable and I'm gonna become a brony to show you how I can take Forbidden Island and change the theme to My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Forbidden Island is a game by Game Right Games that plays two or four players in about 30 minutes. You're on an island with three other people and it's sinking and you have to find four artifacts or treasures and then get off the island before the entire island sinks. This is a cooperative game, so you have to work together in order to survive. The water is rising, and you have to do everything in your power to keep the island from sinking. The longer you wait, the faster the island sinks. To win, all players need to get to Fool's Landing after finding all the artifacts, and they'll take a helicopter ride off the island. Twilight Sparkle and her friends Applejack, Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, and Rarity must stop Nightmare Moon from bringing everlasting darkness to every place in Twilight and her friends must find the elements of harmony scattered throughout Equestria before every place is cast into everlasting darkness. The ponies must work together to win, but it won't be easy. They must choose their moves wisely and make good decisions. If they obtain all of the elements of harmony, then they will be able to show Nightmare Moon kindness and turn her into Princess Luna, a kinder, gentler pony and sister of Princess Celestia. The location tiles were made from tiles that I found in a game called Acuity. The cards were printed on photo paper using the same size as Ticket to Ride the small cards. I used poker chips to create the elements of harmony. If you're not a brony, you can be one. And if you hate bronies, don't be a hater. You might have noticed that I did not show you a Forbidden Island theme of The Simpsons. That's because I ran out of time. This is what it would look like. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I'll see you next time. Hi, welcome to Painting Miniatures 101. Let's continue on with eyes. Now, if you saw a couple weeks ago when I bought some of these, and you're probably wondering, what are we going to do with these? Well, if you remember, for the past couple weeks, I've had you do it outside of, of a black eye and then inside do a blue. What these do is actually dot and puts the iris there. So I actually did this on some miniatures. So why don't we go down to the table and take a look and then come over. What we have here is we put the initial darkness on the outside, then the blue on the inside, and then a dot for the ret retina. A little marking on each side of white to show reflection on each of the eyes. Now another way, if you don't have a steady hand, is using a toothpick. You can use a toothpick or a skewer. I like to use a skewer because it gives me, I have big hands and it gives me more control. So what I do is I get a little paint on, on the end there and then come over and I would hit inside. As you can see, I've already painted the blue and then I'm going to hit and put the retina right in and do the same on this eye. That gives me more control over how I can get the blue and then the blackness in and then I'll take a small brush and put in the little light fixtures. If your hands are not steady the toothpick is absolutely perfect because it gives you more control, especially if you're afraid with a brush because it's so bendy. So that's basically how we do basic eyes. Well, there you have it, how to do the re regular eyes. So until next week, I'm Rob Warren, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>
So I already mentioned at the beginning of the show, but we're going to be doing some reviews this week. You'll see some reviews from Z and from Sam and from our other contributors. But you're also going to see a lot of re, a lot of live playthrough type stuff from me. I'm going to be playing against the internet. So I'm going to be taking a look at um, Concept, Seven Wonders Duel, The Duke, Spectre Ops, uh, Adventure Land, War of Indines, Magical Athlete, Ghost Stories, Targi. Um, so those are just some of the games. I mean, I'll be trying some other ones too, and we'll be taking a look at each one of those um, over to where I'll play, and then you guys get to make the moves back. So keep an eye out for that. And again, I mentioned on Saturday, Rado uh, will be here. Also, we do have a board game blender going up Thursday, and of course, the Dice Tower. You can check that out. So those are things that are coming up. So anyhow. That's what's coming out this week. You can find all that, including all of our podcasts, at Dicetower.com. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. We're less than a month away from the new policies for board game retailers that Asmodee will be enacting on April 1st, 2016. Because, quote... Asmodee believes the next evolution in how people interact with each other in niche marketplaces to be local third places where people celebrate their interests, discover new products, and find new friends or participants. Essentially, Asmodee's stance is that the brick and mortar stores help create lasting memories with the people you care about most. That's why Asmodee's new program rewards those friendly local game shops that promote Asmodee's products with demos and tournaments. But these policies could be seen as simultaneously rewarding brick and mortar board game stores while creating barriers for online retailers. Because in Asmodee's opinion, online retailers don't grow the hobby the way that physical outlets do. Because, quote, Online retail is primarily a mechanism to more efficiently affect transaction and delivery for an existing demand. Now this statement could be interpreted as Asmodee attempting to protect the physical marketplace and board gaming itself from the cannibalization of online alternatives. It's actually a situation somewhat similar to the one that the U.S. Postal Service has recently found itself in. Within the last decade, over 650 postal facilities have been marked for closure or consolidation. But in 2011, the U.S. Postal Service unveiled a plan to win back their waning sales. Their solution? To launch a campaign that encouraged people to revisit the nostalgia of sending handwritten letters through the mail. U.S. Postal Service Judicial Officer William Campbell made the Postal Service's correspondence campaign's case by saying, quote, Sure, email and texting is quick and convenient, and Facebook has photos and videos, but letter writing helps create lasting memories with the people you care about most. Did the Postal Service's battle against online convenience convince consumers to switch and savor the experience of physical mail? Well... Since 2012, the U.S. Postal Service has closed at least 140 facilities in what is just the first of several phases of planned facility closures. The omnipresence of e-commerce is due to more than mere efficient transactions and delivery for an existing demand. And no corporate policy, marketing campaign, in-store demos, or tournaments are going to change the consumer's gravitation towards online convenience. Any company that doesn't embrace the advantages and benefits of the digital marketplace is, at best, shooting itself in the foot, and at worst, risking catching us, the consumers, in its crossfire. It's Adam Dork from NTBG again with another segment of... The Notorious Beards and Gaming. This week's beard comes from Welcome to the Dungeon, a quick two to four player press your luck game about bluffing and bragging about going into a dungeon to see if you come out live or die and first to two golds to win. Let's check out the beard. Not bucking the norm, the mage is the character with the beard. As you can see, it's very long and straight and what I would like to call a wise man beard because it takes a long time to get that. And surprisingly, it has a bead or a braid on it which Falls on the category of more of a wild man or a savage type of beard. It definitely helps his beard stand out and make him more of a unique character with a beard. The Mage from Welcome to the Dungeon. Nice beard. Fun game. You should check him out. 
there's any beards you want point notice to or you like, go in the comments. I've been Adam Dork, and this has been your week's Notorious Beards and Gaming. Let's play some games. Hello, Internet. Welcome back to the game plan. Soon, me and my family are planning on going on a vacation, and we have to figure out which portable games that we want to bring. So me, my younger brother, and younger sister each created a list of our top five games that we want to bring. Today, I'm going to go over my seven-year-old sister Lexi's list. Number five is 12 Days, a holiday-themed card game that my sister likes because of the great artwork, the fact that she can see all 12 of her cards in the card holder, and the fact that it's simple enough to the point where she feels that she can compete with the older kids. Number four is Rhino Hero, a tower-building game where you use cards. My sister really likes this game because she loves building the tower, and also, we have to knock it over more than she does. Number three is Archaeology, a set collection game that takes place at a dig in Egypt. My sister really likes this game because it's simple enough to the point that she's able to play it, but fun enough that everybody else wants to play it with her. Not sure this version's still available, but there has been an updated version that was recently released. Number two is Jaipur, a two-player trading game that everybody in my family loves. It has great components and artwork, but my sister mainly likes it because she loves collecting the camels. And number one on my sister's list is Peña Parada. This game might seem like a simple game of Uno because you're trying to play all of your cards to win. But this game, every round, there's new special abilities that are added in and interact in crazy and wacky ways that keep this game fun. My sister really enjoys this game because of the great artwork and the animals on all of the cards. So next time, I'll go over my brother's top five list. Until then, this is Andrew Cohen, and this has been The Game Plan. Hello, Niels again from Circles Brettspiele, and today in the best and the worst we are talking about the Grand Austria Hotel from Mayfair Games. Yes, let's take a look. My favorite part for Grand Austrian Hotel is dice drafting. So you roll the dice, sort them out by numbers here on the board, and then you can draft a die. So you can take a die, take the action indicated here in front of them, and then next player takes a die and so on and so forth. Uh, the strength of the die is determined by the number of dice, the total number of dice you roll with the same digits on it. So that is very innovative, very new. I've never seen dice drafting before. The thing that I don't like on the game is that there's so much going on. Uh, yeah, maybe that sounds a little bit weird and awkward, but however, you have the main action. The main action is the die. Then you have the free actions. You have five different free actions you can take every turn. You have the actions from your employees, the employee benefits. You have action from the cards. Whenever you fulfill one of these tables, you get points here. You get money here. You... Uh, bring one of these guests in here. Sometimes this gives you that, that bonus is this. All of that triggers into uh, another. And sometimes you're just saying, okay, and now the die. So the die is not really important anymore. All this, oh, I fulfill that, I fulfill that, I take this free action, I make this, I make this. There's so much going on and that forces a little bit for making mistakes sometimes, especially for newbies or gateway gamers. So that was the best. And the worst for Grand Austria Hotel, Mayfair Games. My name is Niels. See you next time. Bye bye. One of my favorite sayings is anyone who says that they I am my own worst critic has never read the internet. Now, in the last several shows, I've been kind of very straightforward. And I got some feedback from people in the last one. They're like, hey, you, why do you want no one to be a publisher? And the answer is not that I don't want anyone to be a publisher, but I want, I really do want to discourage people who are going in half-heartedly. I really do. If you're not going into publishing with 100% and with knowledge, realizing what you're getting into, then I don't think you should get into it. But if you are dead set on it and you have made a plan to get in publishing, then you need to go for it no matter what the critics say. In the words of a great philosopher, never give up, never surrender. The internet is a mean, mean place. Now, board gaming in general is nicer than most of the internet. 
which is a good thing. And I love that, but no matter what the forums, Reddit, Board Game Geek, uh, Constant World, there's lots of small, small forums all over the place. On all those forums are mean, nasty people who will often couch their words by saying, I'm just saying it as it is, or I'm just saying what I think, but they say mean, really nasty things. And I've seen so many people do so many things, whether it's design, publish, put together content for the internet, reviewing or videos or what have you, and people come in, I don't like it, 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 I don't like it. And they don't usually say, I don't like it. They usually will say, I don't like it in a way that insults the person who is doing that. And that's the thing. You're going to get criticism. Now, I can't tell you don't read the criticism because people say it, right? Don't read the criticism, but you're gonna, right? You could say don't read the criticism, but you're probably going to. And not only are you not gonna read, are you gonna read the criticism, you're gonna get it unsolicited. And I think negative criticism really hampers people wanting to do anything at all. I was a choir director for a while, now I'm just in a choir. Um, and I've always had a hard time getting people to join the choir. I would go to someone and say, hey, you want to join the choir? And they would say, well, no, no, I, I, I really can't sing. And I thought, no, are you sure? Because most people can sing. There's a few people in the world who are tone deaf, but it's a pretty small percentage. Most people can sing. But you know what happens? Anytime someone sings, there's always going to be someone who says, don't give up your day job. They're always going to come in, oh, oh, what's that noise I hear? There's very critical people, and even if a lot of it's a joke, you get that constant negative reinforcement. You can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, and it comes from directions. You put that on the internet and add anonymous commenting into it, and it gets even crueler. And it's, that, that kind of thing has always befuddled me because I've met some of these people, some of the meanest people in the world have board game geek profiles, right? And I've met some of these people in person and they're very nice. But when I get on the internet, they become monsters and they say such vicious, cruel things. And of course, again, they justify it. They say, well, you know, I'm just saying what I think. But what they do is they crush people's spirits. But what I'm here to say is don't let your spirit be crushed. Sure, you've designed that game and no one, including the uh, stupidly unintelligent Tom Vassell, trashed your game. Never give up, never surrender, keep going, but learn from it. But you can keep doing it. Keep trying, keep making it better. You publish and your first game didn't sell well. You still feel wanting to publish? Then don't give up. Keep trying, you can do it. Whatever you can do, and I'm speaking very specifically here about the board game business, but if you want to do something, you can do it. And I've said this to my kids all the time. Like, let's say they want to play basketball. Well, you could go out and you could practice basketball every single day. You practice for years and years and years, and you will be very good at basketball. You may never make, you know, the NBA or be a superstar. In fact, odds are you will not. But you will definitely be really good at basketball. You want to play the piano, you practice all the time, you probably won't become Chopin or um, Haydn or Mozart or Bach or any, or I don't know if all of them played the piano, but the ones who played the piano quite well, you'll probably never be one of those great pianists, but you will be able to play the piano really well. If you want to do something well, you can. You just got to put your head down, you got to do it, and you got to ignore the critics or listen to them and maybe get better and improve, but never let them get under your skin. I tell all the contributors on my shows and all the people who do stuff for the Dice Tower Network and everything, I say when it comes down to it, you only have to make sure I'm happy with it. Because everyone else, you're gonna always find someone who dislikes it. All my segments on my show, I've had someone email me and say they hate it, every single one of them. And that includes all the ones I do, <laughs> right? I like your show, but I hate this. But there's lots of other people who like it. So what do I do? Well, in my case, I do what I like. You don't like my component drops? That's fine. I can't please everybody with that, but I love doing them. You don't like my, my suspenders and tie combos? Fair enough. They're tacky, but I like wearing them. I like these hats. I like the games that I like, and I don't care if they're, not, if they're the games that the board game world doesn't like. I don't care if I like a game that most people don't like or I dislike a game that most people like. It doesn't matter to me because I'm having fun. 
yeah, the internet gets me down sometimes. Hasn't been for a while, but sometimes you read the internet and you're like, oh. but I would hope today, if you're watching this and you're a fledgling designer or fledgling puppets, or maybe even a, a, a veteran of one of these, or you're making content for the internet or whatever you're deciding to do, it doesn't even have to be board gaming. If you keep at it and you keep doing it despite that criticism, you will eventually run across people who have been moved and touched by your work. I taught for many years. You know, teaching is not the most rewarding in professions. And I don't think if you like rewarding professions like for accolades and stuff, teaching is not the best at that. And every year I would end the year and I'd think, huh, I don't know if these guys learned anything. But since I first started teaching, which was over 15 years ago, I'm now starting to meet some of these people every once in a while as adults. And sometimes they'll say, hey, I learned something in your class. Hey, thanks for what you taught me there. And you're like, wow, it feels good. It's not, you know, uh, the, it's, it's not, you know, the, they're not doing a whole symphony and then the whole crowd stands up and cheers, but you can say, wow, I made a difference. And you know what the board gaming reviewing? We hope that we make a difference in a few people's lives. You design a game that a few people love, you've made a difference in their life. You publish and some people love that game, you made a difference in their life. So even though I will come down hard on this show and in my reviews and other things and other people will come down, I never want to see someone go, oh, I quit because of Vassal. No, don't quit because of me and don't quit because of those guys on Reddit who don't like anyone anyway. Don't quit because of them. You go out there and do what you like and make it better and make a difference. Yeah, I'm not saying that the difference that we make in board gaming is comparable to some people who make great strides and they, you know, medical advancements and do a lot for other people. But you can make a difference. You can make people happier. Ignore the critics and just get it done and never give up, never surrender. So I'm going to be taking a look here at Spielbox. This is issue number six from 2015. Every once in a while, I'll take a look at a magazine here on the show. Um, are these magazines worth getting? Well, I, I, I think it's kind of a up in the air type thing. This one comes with a promo. It's a free Dominion promo summon. This only works with Dominion Adventures. You, you can go watch my review of that to see. So if you want that, you can get that. And in this, one of the cool things I think about the, the Spielbox here is the advertisements. I get more excited sometimes about these advertisements because they're full-page advertisements about board games. And it's interesting to see. Most of it, though, is about is reviews. So here's a really long review of Mafia the Cuba, which is longer than actually the game is. But again, then you're like, ooh, Rio Grande has these games coming out. And so this is mostly made up of reviews in here. Some of the reviews... Uh, are interesting because they, they give you like a background. This is how the game works together. Um, sometimes I look at these games and be like, what? This game's been out for a long time, but that's because it just came out in Germany. This is a magazine is originally in German and they translate it to English, which they've done pretty well, although occasionally you'll go through something and you'll say, oh, yeah, that's kind of an odd, an odd translation. But like I said, most of it is reviews. However, they do have a report here. This is about the big, giant, world-breaking record event of Catan from Essen Spiel. And then here's some like a quick update, and you can go through and read all the different things, you know, uh, from the different sections that Spiel. So I like this one. I went through and read these, even though I was there. There were a couple sections I read, and like, oh, I didn't see that. And so there's a lot, and this is like then this is like an old game where they're talking about Essen, which came out at Spiel 2013. And then there's more things in here. The this talks about how to ex, to explain a game. More reviews here. They talk about a mathematician and an artist. Uh, more reviews, a kids game review, quick reviews, glance reviews. It's really just review after review after review after review. Is that worth it when you can find all these reviews on the internet? You know, I don't really know. I like to get this game this for a couple reasons. One, I like to get the promo, so I actually pick and choose. If I'm not interested in the promo, I will often not get Spielbox. But I also like getting it because I like looking at the pictures. And if nothing else, if I'm making like some kind of decoration for my house and I want a good picture of a game, 
I don't have to print it out of my printer. I can be like, ooh, there's some nice Lewis and Clark artwork. I might be able to cut that out and put it on uh, some collage or decorate something with that. And I know that's kind of an odd thing, but it, it's a useful thing. And these are interesting magazines. So is it worth the price? Well, if you like a magazine, rather than reading all the free content you can get at Board Game Geek, it's probably worth it, and especially if you want the promo. Other than that, I might pass on it. Well, that's it for another board game breakfast. Huzzah! All right, guys. Well, I'm going to be seeing and talking to a lot of you this week. I hope some of you have some free time for some of those live sessions that we will do. You never know when you'll see the next one. Just keep an eye on our channel. When will something be live? We'll schedule some of them. Others will be done off the cuff. Well, it should be an interesting week. Until next time, though, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.